been a fun, fun weekend. I'm glad I get to join you guys. I didn't know what was being totally planned for the weekend, so when they said about this, I'm like, well, sure. And I uh, figured there'd be folks here. And, and uh, so I don't take this lightly that you let me be right here. Thank you. It's, it's a humbling thing. I don't ask to preach. I've never looked to preach. I, been in love with Jesus for a little while, and he just kind of does things in your life, but I'm a little like I'm thinking axe throwing contest. This is cool. I said, I'm in Canada. I'm, in, I'm up in Canada, and, and I thought, okay, never heard that before. That's, that's amazing, and uh, I, thought, I looked at the date, and I thought, man, it's a little ways away. Some of you guys have a chance to even grow out your beards more, and just get into it, man. Just get, let it go, and you might even throw better. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just pictured some of you guys getting nice and burly and buying a Woolrich jacket and getting in the contest. <laughs> so I won't be here for that, <laughs> but I'm here this morning just for a little while. And I want to cheer your hearts on the gospel. You guys are well taught. I can perceive when I came in, you can just perceive atmospheres. It's awesome. Connectivity and family, and it's good. Uh, man, what an honor, huh? That God would send his son to shed his blood, never get familiar with this, think about this, that, that God would put himself in a body and take on flesh to pay the price for flesh that failed so that he could restore it back to what he always desired and intended. It's so personal and it's so intimate. It's a far cry from blessing. It's a far cry from just going to heaven. And, and I know you guys know that, it's, it's so much more, but I'm, I'm talking to everybody on a very personal, not just corporate level this morning. Man, please recognize that to God, no matter what statement life has made, your life is so valuable to Him. We, we have found identity through so many things. We have found our worth through so many things. Man, we can just let a bad re response from somebody that we respect just crush our whole lives. And the whole time the blood's here speaking better things and God's saying, hey, you're more than what men are seeing. You're more than what you made a mistake in. You have a greater potential than what it's been. Hey, love you. You're so much more. See, the cross doesn't say, you bunch of sinners, I can't believe you did this to me. I wish you'd change like yesterday. Look what your sin has done to me. I hope you get the point. The cross says, I know who you are. I've known you from the beginning. Your life is my plan. Your existence is, is my idea. And when things changed, I became like you, yet without sin, so I could get rid of the problem and move back into your lives and become one with you. I love you people, your lives are worth living. I'm glad to be here. Please the Father to bruise me because he knows who you are and he wants to live inside of you. That's exciting. And this thing is so much more than just encounters with God, as important as they are. I'm not suggesting anything as man, come to your conference and get to know him more and encounter him and receive impartation and let God ravage the atmosphere and touch your life. But make sure that when you wake up in the morning after that conference, that you know you're personally valuable and you have a sphere of influence and your life matters and you're in the roster of heaven and you can shine as a light in your life. You following me? Come on. We are not here just to be touched by God. We are here to be transformed by Him and restored back to His image so His heart and His love is inside of us, loving and living through us. Come on. We are the body of Christ. And the whole reason the morning we gather, it's not because you're a part of Gateway. It's not because this is the church I attend. It's we don't forsake assembling ourselves together so we can stay stirred up in the truth of why we're here, of why he's in us, and stay stirred up in love and good works. I just promise you, now is not the time and never was to get your heart hurt, offended, discouraged, to get self-conscious, low-esteemed, identity struggling. It's never been the time. Christ has come. He's died. He sent a message. Your life's worth living. I want to move inside of you, transform you, call to death the old man and his deeds, and put on a new man called Christ in me. It's really, really exciting, guys. So I just want you to understand that your life matters. I'm not sure if I'm talking to one, but I know I'm talking to everyone in general. But, but don't be deceived in this season. Don't let something matter more than what matters most. And please don't let life speak louder than truth. Because truth is what makes you free. 
And if you're internalizing conversations and relationships and things that are making statements towards you apart from what he said by dying on the cross, you are going to be deceived and make a mistake. And I'm encouraging you to stay encouraged. <laughs> like, like guard your heart for out of it flows the issues of life. Let the why behind your life stay squeaky clean and pure. And don't do things for attention. Don't wear your positional badge, your ministry title for identity. You do what you do for his great name and others. And you'll stay healthy and you'll run well. Yeah. Amen? I'm just telling you, man, this stuff is in my heart to just stir you this morning. I don't know you, but in a way, I know you. There's a time to be born, and here you sit. Your life is the will of God, and I promise you, I've got nothing but love for you. I mean it. You don't owe me a thing. <laughs> I told Pastor, I'm not receiving an honorarium here. It ain't happening. He said, oh, okay. Well, we were ready to bless you and honor you. I said, I'll tell you what honor is. You receive me as from the Lord and chew on what I'm saying, and hopefully I'll leave a deposit, and we'll just run well. Amen. Yeah? I didn't fly up here. I, we didn't schedule this so I could stay booked. And I don't do ministry. I'm in love with Jesus, and I love people. And people let me speak, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't do ministry. I don't promote a thing. I, I, there's people that made a website for me. I like, don't even have a website. I'm not trying to build anything. I just want to minister what's here. And I want to see it multiplied in the lives of believers. And I want to see Christ, the hope of glory, become a reality in your everyday sphere of influence. Where you literally are walking in love where you're Christ conscious, where you're not low esteemed or self-conscious or in the fear of man anymore, where you've had a viable intimacy with God, where you've woken up in the morning with relationship with God and he's fine-tuned your eyes so the lamp of your body is single and you actually understand why you're alive. Yeah? Come on, it's a big deal. So many good people get misdefined through the way life unfolds when Jesus is their true identity the whole time. I've watched good people, through the lack of understanding, take hard hits that understanding would have avoided. I've watched bad things happen to good people, and they internalize it, rationalize it, analyze it, talk to friends about it. It becomes their thing. It becomes their... And all of a sudden, they're no better off than what they're going through instead of the one inside of them. If you squeeze an orange, you expect orange juice. That's a no-brainer. It'd be so weird, dude, if it was apple juice in your cup. <laughs> Why isn't it weird when you squeeze a Christian and get everything but Christ? Man, that should be weird. I wish that was so weird to all of us. That we understand when we got water baptized... We died to ourselves. So could we live unto him? And we realized that we were homeschooled in the wrong home. We were trained by the wisdom of the world. Our emotions weren't even legit. That's why they were so chaotic. And so many people think the way we were is the way God made it. It's the way we became when Adam got cut off and separated from God. You say, well, God gave us emotions, not the ones you grew up with. He didn't. Adam gave you those. And your emotions have a perversion to them because they're all based on a self-centered reaction to life. Nobody had to train you to be angry. It came by instinct. Nobody had to teach you jealousy. It was just there. You didn't have to study to master discouragement. Frustration, competitiveness. It all came with the package of life apart from God. Every man was born into Adam. We must be born again. Let's make sure that's not just a prayer that believes on him and a name written in a book called life. Let's make sure it's his life. 
coming back inside of us to live in us and shine through us so we can be like him. Coming here on a Sunday is good. Keep doing it. But coming here on a Sunday will never change the world. You becoming love has to start having an impact. Yay. <laughs> I'm just here to stir you and remind you why we're here this morning. I think you have a great church. I walked in and I said, oh, it feels good in here. Doing this part of church sometimes can be easy because we get to know one another and connect. Sometimes it's not that way, but in a lot of settings, I see real family units and knit. But this is never a social club. It's not a safe haven. It's not a hideout. It's not a hangout. It's where you come to cheer together a truth that you're living, to honor one corporately in synergism because he alone is lovely and good. And, and, and you stay focused and on track and you join into the great marriage of coming and going. Because you come here, but you live there. So you're coming here to stay so focused on why he's in you and so fixed that when you leave, hopefully, our goal as leaders is that when you leave, you look just a little bit more like him than when you came. <laughs> yeah? And, and midweek services, you can get topical, you can cover a lot of ground and all the stuff we do, but I promise you, midweek service isn't so you can make it to the next Sunday. <sighs> I promise you, that is a lie. Life is not so tough that Sunday to Sunday is a long haul, so we better gather in the middle to stay filled. Well, brother, we leak not through cracks. We leak on people. And you're anointed, and your cup runneth over. Spirituality is not measured by the level of the cup. It's measured by overflow. If they're drinking out of your cup, you got a problem. They're going, you're going dry. <laughs> you are not drinking out of my cup ever. <laughs> you can't even reach the rim. <laughs> I'm just telling you. <laughs> well, you know how you can get burnout out ministry. I have no idea what you're talking about. Because I don't do ministry. I'm in relationship with Jesus and his love has overwhelmed me. I'm not doing ministry. I'm in love. And my cup is running over because he fills the thirsty and floods the dry ground. People say, you've been going all weekend. You're gonna... We rolled yesterday, didn't we, buddy? He said, man, you got a lot of energy. You just go. <laughs> Nobody's drinking out of my cup. We have this Christian idea, brother, let's just pray for you. You've poured out. You've given all weekend. We just want to ask God to just fill you back up and pour back in. I never went empty. It's, it's not Mountain Valley. If you minister out of your gift, that could happen. If you minister out of your relationship, it's not going to. Believe me, if you're doing ministry, it's different than just doing Jesus. And it's not mountain valley. It's not I'm climbing up to God to get filled so I can go back to the earth and pour out till I'm almost drained, make sure I check when the fuel light comes on and climb back up and get refueled. That, that teaching's out there. Let me act it out for you. So you never believe it again. Okay, I gotta get to the mountain of the Lord so I can get in God and get filled with God. I gotta do the Moses thing and spend some time in his presence till my face shines. And I'm just gonna... Yes, oh, yeah, and now I'm going to come down off the mountain of the Lord into the valley where you all are. <laughs> and then you're going to draw on me, and you're going to need me, and you're going to drain me, and you're going to pull on me, and you're going to cry out, and I'm going to... Yeah. 
yeah, I'm coming back <laughs> to where you all are. And after about seven belief systems of that, no, Lord, I don't, people wear on you. People drain you. Ministry's tough. Pastoring be awesome if it wasn't for the people down in that valley. I just want to stay here with you, Lord. It's weird. <laughs> Sorry. It's just weird. <laughs> So I made it look as weird as possible to leave that visual in you. <laughs> and, and I just pray if you ever get in that trap, you see me crawling up there looking goofy. So you get sh shell-shocked right out of the lie. <laughs> Come on, man. Nobody's drinking out of your cup. He said, no need your head. Your cup runneth over. He strengthened you like the wild ox, not the domestic ox. You can't yoke a wild ox. It ain't going to work. You ain't even going to hold him enough to put it on him. You're not going to harness a wild ox. You, you take a massive beast, an ox, a massive strong beast, and they harness him and make him walk in a circle and tread out grain and do the will of another. That's a yoke. He strengthened you like the wild ox. You're yoked up to him. Yeah? His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Come on, think about it. He said, if you're laboring, if you're heavy laden, come unto me. I'll give you rest. You know what we think that is? We think that's Jesus going, on your forehead. That's not what it means. He changes your perspective, your reason for being, and your view on life. It makes your eyes single. He changes what you believe. He doesn't minister feelings to you. He changes what you believe so you're not subject to the lie anymore and the feelings that come with them. You know how many people are even living to survive? You know how many people are tricked into being Christians for their sake? Do you know how many people are Christians for blessing, provision, protection? And they're always on guard and looking over their shoulder and antsy and nervous and knocking on wood, whatever that means, and hoping today's an okay day. And all of a sudden, we've reduced the gospel to a survival kit and a self-serving blessing instead of transformation of my life. Listen, you're never free until you get free from yourself. If you're a Christian for you, you're going to have a hard time you're going to misunderstand and you're going to make mistakes if you're a Christian for you. But if you're a Christian for his great name and for others, you'll have total patience. You'll walk in love. You'll make peace. You'll show mercy. And you'll run well and you'll cross the finish line. You got to get your motivation really clear. Don't just listen to messages that serve you. Don't just listen to things that pertain to your well-being. Your well-being is Christ in you. He loves you, and he'll never judge you for where you've been, but what you've become. You've already won. You're already in him. We've already made it. Now we're going to walk this thing out effectively and let our light so shine so the world is rocked by the glory of who he is. Yeah? It's just true. Like, like, I don't have any other option today. Like, I don't even have a grid. I don't even know what it would mean to think to be any other way. Like, like this joy that's in me, I usually suppress it to communicate. It's true. Because when I, 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 it's so real in me that I have to, because people think, well, are, you, are you serious? Come on, man, nobody's like. I was in a Teen Challenge Center a while ago, and I was in the four-year talking to people, and I was just being me, and the, the, the leader was like, oh, man, because he was pastor called, said, man, I think it'd be great if you just let my buddy Dan come in and talk to these guys. That's his favorite place to be, recovery centers. And he didn't know me. And to a friend, he said, okay. And when I got there, he's weighing me outwardly. He was so humble. He stood up, Pastor, and he cried. His wife got healed. The guy that just retired because he couldn't do the stairway anymore in the facility and he didn't want to retire, but he did because of physical things and kind of went on disability. Got brand new knees when the guys prayed for him. A boy was born with a club kind of funny foot. It changed in the hands of two students. 
We had a pretty cool time. But apart from all that stuff, here's what happened to him. I got up and I started talking for about 10 minutes. You be careful with first impressions. You be careful with snap judgments. You be careful with the Adamic fallen nature presumption tendency that was in our lives that we all think is normal. You don't judge a book by the cover. You don't look at any man from the outside. You look with righteous judgment. Love thinks no evil. Yeah? So he got in a trap and he stood up and confessed it humbly and I thought, bravo for you. What a humble man. You're going to go far, man. Because he doesn't owe me a thing and what he perceives of me doesn't stop the truth that's living in me. So like, here's the raw reality. Can I get raw? Like, no matter what you assess me today, when I get on the plane, I'm still in Christ. I'm still going to hear his voice. Nobody can stop my relationship and the person beside me is probably going to get loved on. And nobody can do anything about it. It's, it's done. I'm not here for you to like me. I want you to. It would be awesome to connect that way. That's not my goal. My goal is to cheer you on and say, this is who you are now that he came. Your life matters. Don't get discouraged. Now's not the day to be disheartened. It never was. We got a truth that makes us free. Let's run well and let's run together and let our lives and him in us make a difference. That's what I'm here to tell you. And if you let something else get bigger, you won't be seeking first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is how God thinks and functions. It's not his outpouring. We're seeking the kingdom of God. Sometimes we think that's his outpouring, his manifestations, his wind, his corporate rush. When you seek ye first the kingdom of God, you're thinking like he thinks. You're not thinking like you used to think. You're not living like you used to live. Your emotions get totally restored and renewed through a new perspective. And all of a sudden, you're not reactionary. You're not trying to suppress anger or you're already angry. You're not trying to forgive or you're already in unforgiveness. Why do we have such a grid for these things? Because we were born into that lie and we were trained by that lie, but now we're born again. When somebody struggles with unforgiveness, it's evidence to me they've never experienced the joy of being washed and clean and pure and holy and completely forgiven and sin in their life, never recognized by God again or brought up or, or flashed back, completely clean, holy, blameless, and above reproach, righteous in the sight of your God. When you taste the beauty of his mercy and his forgiveness, how could I not forgive you and walk in what brought salvation to my life? How could I get this and receive this and viably say I have this and then see you for what I believe is wrong in your life or judge you for what I don't prefer? Friend, never again is that in my life. I'm not preaching me. I'm talking to you about what he wants to do in you and me and how he can lift us up to a place that we weren't before he came. We got to make sure we don't get subtly deceived into incorporating him into our life, but he actually becomes our life. Are you with me? I'm okay. Do I seem dry? Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> I'm going to drink this since he brought it up here. You should ask me for a drink. I'll give. <laughs> I'd have given you living water, man. And you know what, TJ? You drink that one drink, just one drink, you never ever be thirsty again. Ain't that something that Jesus can talk like that? What he's saying is, if you find out who you are through me, you will never be empty, never have a vacuum, never be driven, and never live in weakness, never live in insecurity, never question your identity, never look in the mirror and say anything else, see anything else but what I've seen from the beginning. If you take one true, valid drink from me, your life will be forever secure and filled with the fullness of who I am in you. And you will never be thirsty again. You won't live for false moments, false attention. You won't live for temporal things. You won't be codependent. You won't be needy. You won't go to church to feel accepted. You won't join the people to fit in and feel worthy. You'll come to love and to give and to serve and to pour into what you're part of. It's amazing what people get tricked into. They go to a place like this, they'll sit in a corner, they won't acknowledge anybody, they'll just sit down. 
And when they leave, they say, boy, that wasn't a very loving church. Nobody even talked to me. And I'm thinking, well, it should have been loving you were there. Isn't it amazing how we're in test mode? Isn't it amazing how we've been tricked into needy? So we go to a church to test the atmosphere to see if they, instead of just already being free and filled and just loving people and pouring out your life and It's not what I can get out of an atmosphere. It's what I can bring into it. It's how I can give and lay down and serve and prefer others and not seek my own interests, but also the interests of others. It's actually in the gospel how I can love not my own life unto death and lay my life down for the sake of the whole and the sake of another. Honestly, when I read my Bible, anything else isn't Christianity. It's narrow. It's so good. Because it's where freedom is. Until I'm free from myself, I'm never free. Because I'm self-conscious, I have anxiety, fear has a platform, my well-being I take into interest. Do you understand that some people are Christians for the protection and well-being of their family and close-knit unit? I understand to pray for those things. Pray for your children. Pray hedges and covering and blessing. I get it. But if your motive for a Christian is the well-being of your family, you're in trouble. He said, unless you love less that list that you're a Christian for, you'll never fulfill why you're a Christian. This thing is not preservation. It's manifestation and expression of him. If the only reason you're in this thing is for well-being, you'll freak out just when things are symptomatic. You'll get so self-focused, self-centered, all your prayers will be about your world working. And you'll pray. But your motive is way far from why he's in you. And then it's just about preservation. And all of a sudden, if your child's not doing well, your productivity is racked and shipwrecked and and all of a sudden your countenance is whacked out and, and, and all of a sudden you're just a product of what your child isn't. And then you have your identity wrapped in your children. As much as we love our children, it's so easy to do then because we're not thinking on a spiritual level. And now there's not even faith in our prayers. We're just desperate, crying out. We're non-productive. We're wearing it on our sleeve. And when we go to work, we're just poo. And all of a sudden, it's like, wow, the only reason people go to God is for well-being. And if it ain't happening, we're in a quandary. It's not powerful. Man, the greatest thing you can do is have two children that are making bad decisions and and running wild and you're in a position of faith and you know they've been invested into and you trust the love of God and the hand of God on their life and you believe it won't come to destruction but God will bring them to redemption and reconciliation and you rejoice in that in your bedroom and probably don't just cry out every day and pray. You say, thank you, Father. And you go on and live productive and shine as a light and one day your coworkers will find what your children were going through and say, man, I didn't even ever know that in you. I I would think you would have been a mess. Well, I would have been a mess. I'm in faith. God is bigger than their decisions and actions. His grace and mercy is greater. I was trusting God the whole time. Dude, I'm impressed with that. You like didn't even show that. Christianity is no smell of smoke. (laughs) You've been in Nebuchadnezzar's fire, but you have more passion than ever because there's a fourth man in there. And even though you're in the fire, there's no bonds, there's no bands. You're not handcuffed. The Christian testimony is no smell of smoke. It's not, hey brother, how's it going? Well, keep me in prayer, man. It's a dead giveaway that we're Christians for what he can do for us if we're not careful. I'm not saying that's you. I'm saying don't ever let it be you. I'm here to stir you on and cheer you on. I'm not here to correct you. I'm here to tell you who you are. Hopefully co-labor with this man in leadership and help nail some things down that they believe in. And hopefully we had a good morning. Your life is worth his blood. That's a big deal. And I'll make this comment in closing. Just the whole goal, 1 Timothy 1.5, the whole goal of our instruction is love. Why is that? Because in the beginning when God made man, He made man in his image and his likeness. And when he breathed into man, man became a living being. So would you agree with me that we have enough evidence scripturally that all that God was, who he is, was inside of man and that they were one? Would you agree? So two were one. And he said, subdue the earth. Not be subdued by it. Not live in fear. Not be vulnerable. Subdue the earth. Work it. Tend it. Subdue it. I'll give you dominion over the work of my hands. Yeah? It's a big deal. So God is love. 
I get it now. Wow, this changed my life 22 years ago. You made Adam to love. You made Adam to be like you, to shine, to overtake the earth with the glory of who you were. You told him to be fruitful and multiply, but you had him in a confined garden space. That's a one, two room apartment. You're going to be fruitful, multiply. You're going to outgrow that space. But that was the place of your glory and paradise and presence. And they were your workmanship and your crowning creation and glory. So, so wow, be fruitful and multiply, but they're in a confined garden space. What's the whole point? That they reproduce after their own kind, seed time, harvest time. That out of the fullness and strength of who God was in their lives, they would come together and multiply. Not just sexual urges, not just, hey girl, you're looking good today. Hey, you know, I'm having the urge to be a mom. No, no. Just coming together in absolute selfless, amazing, honorable love. My life is yours, your life is mine too. Become one. Bam! Seed in that place. Something reproduced after its own kind. Spreading out the garden till the whole earth is filled with His glory. That was what was going down. That's why when that was lost and Moses was in the wilderness with the children of Israel and they were just messing, messing it, missing it, missing it over and over and over. And God said, he said, Moses, you know, he, man, he, he probably had a dude just walking around with a wardrobe, you know, and he'd put on a new, and he tear it, dust, God. This is crazy, man. So he's in one of those moments and he's all dusty headed and he's torn up in his shred, it is threads, right? And, and he's crying out for the people, would you forgive me? And God says, oh, I'll forgive him, da, da, da. He says, but let me tell you something, Moses. And God prophesies he's God. He says, as surely as I live, the whole earth, in the midst of terrible cycling, terrible mess, surely as I live, the whole earth will be filled with my glory. What's he doing? He's going back to the beginning, the original value, where his love never fails. On your darkest, most willful day, he said, I know who you are, even if you don't. And I love you for what I made you to be. And I'm not mad at you. I'm longing for you. I'm not frustrated with you. I'm drawing you. And when your sin abounds, my grace is coming greater, because I have a destiny for you. And I've known it from the beginning. And even though you don't see it, and forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. I'm here to light this thing up and give you understanding and draw you unto me. Yeah? Come on, it's the gospel. It's the gospel. So here's what I found out when I was reading my Bible. Here's what I found out. Oh my goodness, God made man to love. And love doesn't seek its own. And love never, ever keeps a record of wrong or takes an account of the wrong done to it. Well, the fact that we have so many issues and people stuff, well, they did, well, they shouldn't, have. well, how come they, well, that hurt, well, no wonder I'm upset, well, how would you feel? And all that language that came along the way is all anti-love. And we learned it from a lie. You never saw what we grew up saying in Jesus' life. And he never taught us these things. So where did we learn it? Here's what happened. God says, Adam, the day you eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the day you surely die. Well, he didn't fall over dead. We all know that. And we've preached on this and preached on this, but it's so simple. It's just there's a lot there, so it's not wrong that we preach on it. But it's so simple. Don't miss the main thing. The image died. His creative value was lost. Through sin, he got separated from the source of love and immediately became in need of love. And every man since that day was born into that lie and needed love. We have it all psychologically assessed. Well, everybody needs connectivity. Everybody needs a strong support system. Everybody needs, a, everybody needs encouraged. Everybody needs a kind word. So we live from the place of weakness hoping everybody around us does us right so we can be okay. We've been forced into a needy position that's unfulfilled. And we get tricked into finding ourselves through one another when all you can ever find yourself through is Him. If I wake up to need you, I woke up to set you up to fail me. And now you're my justification for not being like Him because you didn't do what I need. When Adam sinned, he got cut off from the source of love and love became in need of it. And everyone in this room knows what I'm talking about. That's how we were born. 
And from the littlest age you can remember, the youngest age you can remember, you needed valued, you needed support, you needed consistency, you needed something solid, you needed somebody to say something good about you, you needed somebody to want you, to value you, to encourage you. Why? Because we were all in the rat race of searching for who we are. And we take some hits at a young age, and at a very young age, all of a sudden, you're nothing more than a product of how you responded to how it went down. That's why people treasure their stories even though they're wicked, even though their past is bad. They still hold on to it and think it's them. Well, you don't know what I've been through. Well, you don't know what it was like when I was growing up. Well, you don't know what happened to me when I was four. And it's the language I hear nonstop, and it proves that we identify through our lives instead of his. And we're trying to psychologically minister to ourselves, in a sense, without the power of truth that makes you free in a single eye. What does it matter? Let me challenge you. What does it matter that my dad never said he loved me and was a severe alcoholic, was bleeding out of his behind when I was a very young age, unhooking himself from ICU units, putting on his clothes, slipping to the bar, sneaking out of the hospital? What's it matter? that I didn't have a daddy that was solid grown up? What's it matter that my mother was sick for 40 years and died at a younger age than necessary? What's it matter that I was touched inappropriately, hardly remember it, but know it happened around age four by babysitter? What, what does any of that have anything to do at all remotely with Christ coming inside of me, giving me lo- new life, separating me from lies and showing me who I am through his cross? Why do I need to even be prayed for, ministered to? None of that has anything to do with Christ in me, the hope of glory. And I don't have time to debate it, and I don't have time to go back there because it's going. And I'm not going to be Lot's wife stuck between where he brought me and where he wants me. I will not be a pillar of salt looking over my shoulder when I'm the bride of Christ. I will look unto him from whence comes my help. And the just shall live by faith. You can't make up for yesterday, but you can become what you're paid for to be today. And you can wake up in the morning and shake that old thing off and say, thank you for the gift called life. Watch this. wonder if you let the gospel teach you this in the morning, every morning. Father, thank you this morning. No one owes me a thing. That would do your marriage amazing if you believe it. No more silent treatments. No more manipulation and control. No more moodiness. And then come to church, holy, holy, yeah. I've been around us. And then you leave, yeah. Where do you want to eat? I want to, oh, I don't want to eat there. Well, you shouldn't ask me then. Why'd you, well, you, I just was, I just, I'm tired. Of, well, yeah, but, but. And you come back. <laughs> Probably not good. <laughs> Here's why I'm saying that. Because when those things are relevant, you've lost your impact. You're doing church instead of being her. Let's make sure we don't learn how to do good church and miss becoming her. It's just loving encouragement. It's not correction. It's not harsh. My heart feels so much compassion in me when I'm talking like this. I am not here to hurt you. I'm here to cheer you on and say, let's run well together. Submit to this leadership and and commit yourself to the cause of God in your community and don't ever look back. Go after this thing and keep your heart from offense and disappointment and discouragement. You be honest with me. If you're discouraged, where's your focus? On how whatever it is you're discouraged over is affecting you personally and what it's creating and causing in your life and how you have to deal, respond, or cope. True? Watch. It's a self-centered perception, right? If any man come after me, let him first. Do what? We've got to learn what that means without legalism and rigidness. Wow, it was never made for me. I was made for your image. 
So me living for me is the biggest lie on the planet. Men living for themselves when they're created for his image. You be honest, countless messages have been preached for generations that pertain to the benefit of the hearer, not the transformation. So discouraged people go to church wondering why faith isn't working and why God isn't moving and why their blessing didn't come in and why their doors didn't open. And the whole time they're in that quandary, they're rendered unproductive because it's all about their blessing, not shining. You wake up in the morning for one reason, scripturally, one reason, to shine. And if you've missed shining, you've missed the point of why you woke up. You're on the earth to love. And when you yield to that simple, beautiful place, the blessing beyond description floods your life and the joy of it all is overwhelming. When you get free from you, you're finally free. Because when I'm free from me, guess who else I'm free from? You. <laughs> so no longer can you be my justification. No longer can you be my excuse. No longer will I only be as strong as the weakness around me. And no longer will you ever be my reason for not being okay. Because you're not Jesus. I'm called to love you, not need you. I need you to lock arms so we can run together and have a greater impact. But the day I need you to know who I am, there's a weak link in my life. And I'm going to let you set me up to fail. I shouldn't even put that on you, should I? Do you know how many people are hurt by people in ministry? Do you know how many people are hurt by people in church? It proves we don't have a revelation of everything we're singing. And we've allowed who we were to carry over into who we've become. You good? Just cheered you on. I'm not praying down fire right now. I'm not even praying for the sick right now. I'm not doing any of that right now. I'm going to sit down and graciously say thank you. I feel like I've said what I'm to say. I, your life is worth this to him. And it's not a hardcore, heavy-duty, oe old thing. It's a wow, what a privilege. New perspective. Life is amazing. What a gift. Whew, I'm going to love you because you love me and I'm going to see people more like you see them. I thank you you're putting who you are in me in an effective way and you start saying things like this in prayer and I'm so excited to realize nobody owes me a thing. I'm complete in you. I'm fulfilled in you. I know the love of Christ. I know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and I'm filled with your fullness. I'm a house with no empty rooms. There's no vacancy in me. I'm fully occupied. No one owes me a thing. I am free to love. Ain't that something? Like today, I'm going to go through the airport. Not one person has the remote ability to frustrate me in public. I just came here and a one and a half year old kicked my seat 1,000 times. <laughs> and God had me sitting in the seat on purpose because he knows it doesn't matter even a little bit. I'm looking back, loving that guy, tickling through the seats. He's peeking his head through. Hey, you little buddy. Peek him out. The window shade went up 200, down 200 times. Means nothing. He's a little, innocent, precious, non-assuming child. And I've got nothing but love for him. And I tell the parent or grandparent in this case, don't you be under pressure. You need to discipline and teach, I understand, but don't you be under pressure. This little guy has zero ability, zero to wear me thin, zero. I get on a Southwest flight and there's a lady sitting with a tiny little baby. First come, first serve seating. You know how Southwest works? Maybe you don't. You just walk in your boarding zone. I'm in A. 
I walk in, I got every seat on the plane practically. There's 15 people ahead of me. She's one because mother and children first, infant child, lap child. She's sitting there and uh, on the end, in case she has to get up, she's sitting on the aisle. Guess what I did? I come over and sat in the middle. I got 150 seats to pick. And she panicked. She said, oh my goodness, sir, you don't want to sit here. I got my infant child. I don't even know how this is going to go. You have all these other seats. Why would you sit here? I said, that's why I'm sitting here, because you have your infant child. She said, what do you mean? I said, because it's a full flight, and somebody's going to get forced to sit here. And they won't be able to handle it, maybe. And they might be frustrated. But I got nothing but love for you and love for your baby. I'm sitting here to tell you everything's going to be fine. I don't want somebody forced to sit here and go, oh God, I got to sit beside the kid. <laughs> oh boy, I got a middle seat. Well, somebody has to sit there. Why can it never be you? Because you have status. I think we have humility and laid down lives. <laughs> I fly all the time. I have status. I don't even use it. I don't want it. It'll corrupt me, I think. It'll spoil me. I let the computer sit me. I sit in the middle a lot. <laughs> Wonder if you get a seat back by the pooper, dude. Somebody got to sit at the pooper. <laughs> Why can it never be you? Probably be good to sit there once in a while. It's just simple stuff. Look, if you're going to get let the seat in your plane on your flight dictate your disposition, you're a giveaway. Life is going to eat you alive and you'll do church, but you'll be shipwrecked when it matters. Because you'll be more worried about your flight than the person that needs Jesus beside you or the person that's hurting two seats over. You won't even discern it because you're wondering if you're going to make your connection. What's it matter? My life's not my own. I'll get home soon enough, but we'll love a few people on the way. <laughs> Yay. Can't believe my limits, my flight. What did I do to open this door? God, why are you letting this happen to me? <laughs> Don't let that be your theology. You guys okay? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I didn't shake you up too much. <laughs> I just want you to live genuine. Can I pray over you? Would you let me? Please? Are we good? Did I finish? We're about 10.30, you said, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I just realized I went past, and I'm like, uh-oh. You saw me, I look at my watch 20 times and then I'm like, ah! <laughs> Father, I thank you. Let's be, on, let's be honest in this. Let's not be religious. Let's not be rhetorical. Would you do something? Would you activate your heart? Stand to your feet with me. Please, if you understand what it means to lift your hands to the Lord and yield and surrender, please do that. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I'm not commanding you. But make yourself available to him. Position yourself before your king. Father, let these words bring fruit into our lives. Let these words protect. That's good. Thank you. Let these words protect us in our soul because none of us woke up to miss you. I know that in the room. I'm not talking to hypocrites. Are you kidding me? I'm talking to your children. None of us woke up to miss you. Let us stay fine-tuned. Don't let the little foxes sneak in and steal the fruit that's growing on these vines. God, let us be effective. Let our lives be dynamic. Let our lives be influential and reproductive. Father, I pray in this house that the light would shine strong. And I pray, Lord God, that these people would so understand that they're coming here to be trained, equipped, and empowered to go there. And I thank you that in their everyday life, Christ matters through their life and the lives of others. Without them trying to be evangelistic, without them under pressure evangelistically, that love itself is evangelistic, and that the draw and attraction of what you've done in them is powerful and enough. In Jesus' name, I bless this house and pray for wisdom and thank you that the grace rests upon it. Amen and amen.